small and mighty choir that we have. Huh? Well, since we're sitting here this morning in a United Methodist Church, a Christian church, a church of Jesus Christ or Jesus the Messiah, it's easy to forget how hard a title that once, uh, how, how hard one a title that was. Um, if events had turned out even just a little differently, we might know him as Jesus the prophet, or even Jesus the first century martyr, but not as Jesus the Christ, the anointed one of God, who was and is and always shall be. Based on evidence in the Bible, we might even be sitting here in the church of John the Christ, formerly known as John the Baptist, uh, who many believe to be the true Messiah of God. According to Luke, John's birth was just as miraculous. Uh, it was announced by the angel Gabriel, just like Jesus' birth. Unlike Jesus, John was descended from priests, priests on both sides of his family. John didn't waste any time in a carpenter's shop. He was an evangelist from the word go. And he lived this austere life in the desert and uh, with equally austere disciples. While Jesus was down in town, you know, having fancy suppers with people who drank too much and laughed too loud, John was scavenging for his food in the desert. If he found something to eat, he ate. If he didn't, he didn't. He avoided alcohol altogether, the same way he avoided anything that might soften the sharpness of his focus on God. Everything about him set him apart as a holy man. His way of life, his clothing, and above all, his message. No one had heard anything like this in 500 years. Ever since the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, Israel had just been passed down from one superpower to another, from Greece to Egypt to Syria to Rome. And all those powers came with their own gods, of course, as well as their own laws and customs. The promised land had become like a tarnished trophy handed from one empire to the next. The chosen people had become a conquered people whose value lay chiefly in their ability to pay taxes. What was missing from all of this was any reaction at all from God. Where were the prophets who had once spoken for God to the people? Where was Nathan, you know, who opened King David's heart to the consequences of his affair with Bathsheba? And where was Elijah, you know, calling down fire from heaven so that no one that saw it could doubt the existence of God? And where was Amos, you know, shouting himself hoarse about God's disgust with Israel's obscene wealth and empty religion? Those voices had been missing in Israel for 500 years. And then along came John the Baptist, who appeared in the wilderness, sounding like God's own air raid siren. You know, finally, someone was speaking the language of God again, language of sin um, instead of profit, talking about repentance instead of compromise. John was not interested in helping be, uh, people become more productive members of society. He wanted them poised to enter the kingdom of God, and he was more than happy to pronounce judgment on anyone who stood in the way. John let King Herod have it for being an all-around evil guy. He let the Pharisees and Sadducees have it for teaching religiousness over righteousness. He promised everyone that God was coming with a sharp axe and a flaming torch to clean up the world that had become impassable with dead wood. It was an invigorating message, to say the least, and John won a lot of converts. If there was a drone, you know, hovering over the desert, they would, it would have seen a long line of pilgrims reaching all the way from the city to John's encamp encampment by the river, John's church, where he would hear people's confessions and renew their hope that God had not abandoned them. It would not be long until the world was a different place, he told them. He was just the beginning of the transformation, and God had already chosen someone else to complete it, and that someone was walking toward John even as he spoke. 
When Jesus met John, can't you imagine that the air just crackled between them? There must have been like lightning bolts. I can't imagine. John was ecstatic. You know, finally, things were going to get off the ground. Finally, God had sent the chosen one, and it wouldn't be long now before things got rolling. The Messiah was about to establish justice on earth. At least that was John's hope in the beginning. But then Herod's soldiers came with a warrant for his arrest, and this man, who lived as far as he could from, you know, human corruption, found himself caged in Herod's basement like a rat. And the good news was that Jesus was still free, right? Still hastening the kingdom, which must have been the only consolation John had. Somehow or another, John kept up with what Jesus was doing. His disciples found some way to get messages to and from him. And the early reports of Jesus' ministry were pretty encouraging, right? Miraculous healings were happening, exorcisms, plenty of signs and wonders, and that was good. That would get people's attention for the big announcement when Jesus finally declared John's, uh, God's judgment. That would give him the authority he needed. Only the big announcement never came. While John sat muzzled in jail, the only reports he received were about Jesus playing doctor with some very marginal people, you know, lepers and demoniacs and hemorrhaging women, even a soldier's slave. What kind of witness was that to God's justice? How was any of that going to get people to know right from wrong? It's not possible to psychoanalyze John without indulging in some fiction. We just don't know what went on inside of him while he was in Herod's jail. We do know that Jesus never organized a picket outside the jail or did anything else to get John released. We know that John's disciples came to Jesus to question him about his laxity in spiritual practice. And we know that John himself finally sent a message to Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we wait for another? Or in plain talk, was I wrong about you? It sure looks like I was wrong about something. If I was right about you, I was wrong about the Messiah. And if I was right about the Messiah, I was very wrong about you. If you know who you are, could you please just say so? Only Jesus would not just say so. Instead, he turned John's disciples around so that they were looking at some of the people who followed him. It was maybe a gimpy, twitchy group, to be sure, but they were more whole than they had ever been in their lives. They knew they were the lucky ones, too. There were still, still plenty of blind people who were still blind and plenty of dead people who were still dead. Jesus could not get around to everyone. But he had gotten around to them, and there was no doubt in their minds who he was. Go and tell John what you see and hear, Jesus said to the disciples. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. It was Isaiah's prophecy coming to life, not, not the part that John focused on, you know, about God coming with a vengeance or with terrible recompense, but the other part about the lame leaping like deer and the tongue of the speechless singing for joy. And then as a loving P.S. to the one who had baptized him, Jesus added a new little beatitude at the end. And blessed is John if he can handle his disappointment in me. John had wanted a tidal wave of Messiah, someone who would be impossible to miss, who would make a clean sweep of things, right, who would witness to an omnipotent and righteous and the righteousness of God. What John got instead was a steady drip of mercy from the man named Jesus, in whom plenty of people saw no Messiah potential at all. As far as anyone knows, John died unconvinced. That breaks my heart. He died wondering who Jesus was and what kind of joke God had played on him to have made him the messenger for such a languid savior. I wish I could tell you that Jesus' own death uh, and resurrection changed everything. 
that once the word got out about God bringing him back to life, everyone saw the light and repented there on the spot. They revised their priorities, they reformed their values, they resolved to live the way Jesus had shown them to live, and God rewarded them with everlasting effect. I wish I could tell you that today everybody knows this story, everybody knows who Jesus is, everyone understands that he is the open door between heaven and earth, and that God through him is at work in the world even right now as we speak, acting with great power and might so that the kingdom might at last come. Sometimes I would give anything for one fireball from heaven, one raw blast of power, you know, that, and God, from a God that would just sweep away mine and everyone else's doubts. But what I have instead is this steady drip of mercy from the followers of a man called Jesus who's still playing doctor to a lot of marginal people in this world with a message that all of us are beloved. Jan Richardson has a website called, um, ah, sorry, skipped my mind, but I have it back here, The Painted Prayer Book. It's wonderful. If you ever want to see just some beautiful writing and liturgical art, She's your girl. But anyway, she writes some wonderful stories, and this is one of them. Fayette, I first heard of her in a story by Janet Wolfe, who used to serve as the pastor of Hobson United Methodist Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Hobson UMC is a wildly diverse congregation that includes, as Janet has described it, people with power and PhDs, and folks who have never gotten past the third grade, folks with two houses and folks living on the streets, and as one person who struggles with mental health declared, those of us who are crazy and those who think they aren't. Years ago, a woman named Fayette found her way to this church, and she lived with mental illness and lupus. She was homeless, and she joined the new member class. And when they had their conversation about baptism, uh, it was explained that this holy moment, when we're named by God's grace, came with such power that it cannot be undone. And Fayette just grabbed onto that. In her imagination, she could, she could feel what baptism would mean. And so Janet tells her class, uh, or she was telling how during her class, Fayette then would ask people, so when I'm baptized, I am, and the class would say, Beloved, precious child of God and beautiful to behold. And she'd say, oh, yes. And, she, and then they could go back to their discussion. Well, the day of Fayette's baptism came, and this is how Janet describes it. She said, Fayette went under and came up sputtering and cried, and now I am. And everybody sang in the uh, congregation, beloved child of God and beautiful to behold. Oh, yes, she shouted, and she danced around Fellowship Hall. Two months later, Janet received a phone call. Fayette had been beaten and raped and was in the county hospital. Janet says, so I went. I could see her from a distance, pacing back and forth, and when I got to the door, I heard, I am beloved. She turned and saw me, and she said, I am beloved, a precious child of God. And, and then catching sight of herself in the mirror, hair sticking up, blood and tears streaking her face, dress torn, dirty, rebuttoned, askew, she started again. I am beloved, a precious child of God. And she looked in the mirror again and declared, and God is still working on me. If you come back tomorrow, I'll be so beautiful, I'll take your breath away. Amen. Beloved, the voice from heaven had proclaimed as the baptismal waters of the Jordan rolled off Jesus' body. Beloved, the voice named him as he prepared to begin his public ministry. Beloved, spoken with such power that it would permeate Jesus' being and his teaching and his ministry. Beloved, he would name those he met who were desperate for healing, for inclusion, for hope. 
beloved, echoing through the ages, continuing to name those drenched in the waters of baptism, beloved, child of God, beautiful to behold. Janet continues, Fayette, beloved, precious child of God and beautiful to behold, haunts me, blesses me, goes with me into this season. She challenges me to ask what it means that like her, with her, I have been named by God, by God's grace with such power that it can't be undone. As I remember the baptism of Jesus, how will I reckon with the fact that I, that we, that all of us shared in those waters, that in the sacrament of baptism and as members of the body of Christ, we too are named as beloved children of God. How will we live in a way that others will know themselves as named by God, as beloved by God, especially those who have been given cause to think that they're less than loved, that they're less than children of the one who created them. There are many who go on wondering if they have been abandoned by God. They listen to these bold claims of faith, and they look at the modest yields, and who can blame them when they ask, are you the one to come, or is there another? The only way I know how to answer that is to point to how stone is shaped by water, drop by transparent, short-lived drop. Water transform, transforms rock like no tidal wave ever could. For reasons beyond our understanding, that's how our Messiah has decided to come for now. Not all at once, not in some lightning bolt, but steadily, drop by drop for millennia. Every time someone lives as he lived, by loving as he loved, another drop falls. For some people, that's not enough. For others, it's the way of life. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at him. Amen. Amen.